Tonight we are studying prophecy, okay? So let's have a word of prayer and ask God to uh, open our minds and open our hearts and also that uh, he would just keep us alert tonight as we think about the end times. This is certainly a big topic of interest right now with all that is transpiring. And if you remember, I was speaking on the subject of prophecy prior to the pandemic on Wednesday nights. Um, We're not necessarily going to return back to that, but we're going to move a little bit in a different direction. And as you can tell, the topic here tonight is going to be dealing with a cashless society. But let's pray. Uh, A lot's been going on. How many of you have had a busy day? (laughs) <laughs> it's been busy, right? We come to church, we're tired, we're a little bit worn out. Let's just pray that God will keep us alert, our minds sharp tonight as we study God's word. And uh, let's just have a word of prayer. Lord, thank you for the privilege of being in your house with your people. And we are so very, very grateful for the Canton Baptist Temple. Thank you for this church family. And thank you for their faithfulness to you and to this ministry And uh, we think about how good you have been to us even throughout this pandemic. Uh, God, you have supplied all of our needs. And we stand amazed at what you have done. You are a good God. You are a great God. And Lord, uh, help us to be careful to give you all the honor and all the glory, all the credit for anything good that's accomplished here at this church. And Lord, tonight as we think about this subject of prophecy and we look specifically at The book of Revelation, I pray, God, that you would open our hearts, open our minds, keep us alert. I pray, Lord, that you would change us tonight. May this not just be an informational class, but may it be an inspirational class tonight. And we thank you for each person who is here tonight. I pray that you would give them a special blessing for prioritizing being in your house tonight with your people. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, I'm going to get to it in a minute, but would you please turn to Revelation chapter 13, okay? We'll get to that passage of Scripture in a minute. But as you can see uh, on the screen here, I'm going to talk uh, in depth tonight about a cashless society, the perfect environment for the Antichrist global economy. Sort of a long, long title, but I'm not real good with uh, titles, but I'm sort of proud of myself for this one. I think this one's pretty good, all right? I'm not very good with uh, coming up with good titles for lessons or messages, but uh, this is a long title, but it really describes what I'm trying to get across. A cashless society is uh, what you're going to find out in a minute, what we're really dealing with uh, today. And uh, then the last part of that really ties in the book of Revelation as we think about the Antichrist and the global economy that he is going to put in place. I believe that you would agree with me when I say that times have really changed over the last 50 years. When we think about the last six months, a lot has changed. But now go back 50 years. A lot has changed. No doubt some of you remember using the rotary dial phones. Do you remember that? You know, you remember those? You you worked them, didn't you? The rotary dial phones. Or having black and white televisions with the rabbit ear antennas. Do you remember that? You'd have to go up and sort of adjust it a little bit to get rid of that staticky, you know, look on the television and... Clotheslines, typewriters. Remember typewriters? I took that in high school. And we had those little little small strips of whiteout. If you made a mistake, you put that in there and hit that again. You remember all that? Boy, those days are behind us. Eight-track stereos. I'm starting to talk your talk now, right? Oh, to be back in the good old days. Some of you also remember the days when all you used was cash or a check to purchase something. I remember one time as a boy, um, my parents were coming back on furlough, and uh, we were in Texas, actually, at the time, and uh, we were going to uh, the grocery store. We had to go and get some groceries, and we went to 
uh, I don't know, they're not up north, but down south, they have Piggly Wigglies. You remember the Piggly Wigglies? And uh, I remember as a boy, uh, my mom uh, getting up to the cashier and uh, writing a check. And she actually wrote the check out to Piggy Wiggy is what she is. She left the L out of Piggly and left the L out of Wiggly, all right? And guess what? They cashed it. <laughs> it went right through. But there was that day and time when we didn't have any plastic cards in our wallet, right? You remember that? I laughed the other day. We were looking. We were uh, out of town up at uh, Erie visiting Connor up there at college, and uh, he had uh, ripped a hole in his uh, khaki shorts. I told him he's getting a big behind on him, all right? So he's... <laughs> He's eating that, maybe that freshman 15, is that what they call it, where you gain 15 pounds of freshman? But anyway, I think it's all the workouts. So let's be positive now. Um, but anyway, had to go and get that, and uh, we went and found a Macy's. And uh, the guy said, would you like to uh, put this on your Macy's card? And uh, my response was, well, does that get me a discount? You know what I mean? I'll, I'll use it if it'll get me something off of it. Well, sure enough, it did. So I said, honey, do you have your Macy's card with you? Big old stack of cards come out, you know. <laughs> Dillard's, Kohl's, you know, you go through these things. So uh, found the Macy's card. So there was a day and time when we didn't have any plastic cards on us, right? You either had ca cash or you had a checkbook, right? Those were the two ways that you paid for things out at retailers. But today, <laughs> today, it's not hard to imagine a world in which our children or our grandchildren may not know what money even looks like or feels like. They'll never know what the sound of change is jingling around in your pocket. They'll never hear maybe expressions like, do you have any spare change? Or, hey, just keep the change. Or, can you break a 20 for me? Those things will be a thing of the past. When it comes to paying for something, it's becoming more and more cashless. Let's talk about this just for a moment. Here's some recent stats that tell us where we are in America today. 80% prefer card payments over cash. That's where we're at. We'll talk more about how COVID-19 has played into that. Okay? We're, we're, we're living this out. <laughs> it's one thing to read what's going to be in the end times. It's another thing to see what is actually transpiring and go, oh, I get it. It all makes sense, right? So 80% prefer uh, card payments over cash. Number two, 76% of consumers have at least one credit card. At least one credit card. Only 10% of consumers make all their purchases with cash. Only 10%. Think about that. There are... How many of you can interpret this number? 459 billion credit cards in circulation in the United States. Is that million? Million. 459 million. See, I was testing you. I've had a long day too. You're not the only one who's had a long day, okay? 459 million credit cards in circulation. Debit cards account for 67% of card payments today, okay? More than 90% of the people getting monthly Social Security benefits receive those benefits by electronic payments. How many of you fall into that category, All right? Hands are going up. You're the part of the 90%. My point is this. We're moving very quickly toward a cashless society. 
If you're wondering whether this is really true or not, I want you to answer the following questions. You don't have to out loud answer them. Do you use direct deposit for your paycheck? How many credit cards do you have? Do you find yourself using a debit card more frequently than using cash? Have you used a credit card or debit card for purchasing groceries? Have you used a credit or debit card for purchases of less than $5? I have. You say, well, that's stupid. Have you ever gone through lately the self-checkout line at Walmart? They no longer take cash. Go through that self-checkout line where you used to put a $10 and it suck it in, you know, and you get your change. Okay, you go through there now, and it'll even ask you on the screen, if you're wanting to pay with cash, you need to go to a different cash register. You can't self-checkout. So then you're like in there getting two candy bars, or, well, that's not for me, but <laughs> two candy bars, well, then you got to use your debit card. Have you purchased items over the Internet? with a credit or debit card, okay? Now, think about all those questions. Let me quickly say that there's nothing necessarily wrong with any of these activities as long as you pay off your credit card every month. That's the way I operate, okay? I have for decades, <laughs> and I'm not real old, okay? But pay them off. I personally would have had to have answered yes to all six of those questions. All six of them. Hopefully you can see what is happening as we move more and more toward a cashless society. By the way, this dramatic shift from a cash-driven society to a cashless society only facilitates more government control and more economic globalism. Okay, and you're going to find out more about that here tonight. Let's answer this question. Why would the economies of the world want to go cashless? If you really think about it, there are many advantages to having a cashless society. Number one, that's certainly being communicated, is what? Convenience, right? Just convenience. Uh, retailers would no longer have to worry about bounced checks, credit checks, or looking at IDs. That's a thing of the past, right? Most of you have no doubt heard of what we call contactless payment technology. How many of you have heard of that? If you've never heard of it, how many of you have seen this? Have you ever seen that? You have, haven't you? How many of you have used that? Don't be ashamed. Yeah, I've used it, right? That's the sign for a contactless. Now, that's a big thing today with the COVID, right? Contactless. I mean, even Taco Bell's trying to do that, right? How many of you go to Taco Bell, all right? When you go to Taco Bell, you know, you place your order... You say, okay, I got my debit card right here. Oh, they don't want to touch it. They hold out, you know, and then you do that, you know, and taking care of Then they bring a bucket with your food in it, a bucket, you know, or a tray or whatever, and they put it out there, contactless. They don't want any contact. With, okay, this is, contact. you say, what are you talking about? How does this work? All you got to do is lay your card up there. You don't have to insert your card. All you got to do is just, Lay it on there, and bam, takes care of it. Or you say, I don't even want to do that. You can do it with your phone. So you take your phone, lay your phone up close to it. Don't even have to touch it. Just get real close to it. And then that's what we call contactless payment. So contactless payment will make checking customers out at a cash register really a thing of the past. Okay, we'll talk more about that in a minute. But let's talk about the second advantage, less crime. Less crime. Going cash 
eliminate muggings and bank holdups and on and on the list goes. At least that's what they say, all right? A third advantage would be eliminate counter. The Secret Service was created in 1865. Did you know that? The Secret Service in the United States was created in 1865 by Abraham Lincoln to deal with a national crisis. Here was the national crisis. One-third of the nation's money at that time was counterfeit. One-third. And so he created the Secret Service to deal with getting all this counterfeit money out of circulation. According to the Secret Service today, it's far, far less, but still a lot. It's anywhere from $70 million to $200 million of counterfeit money that is in circulation. Well, if you go cashless, you don't have that problem anymore. Okay? Number four. Control the spread of disease. Now we're getting to where we're living right now, right? Maybe you're looking at the others and going, okay, the convenience, yeah. But now the control of the spread of disease. Let's talk about that. As they say, all money is dirty money. (laughs) All money is dirty money. Paper money in America is made up of 75% cotton and 25% linen, making it a very attractive source for bacteria. Paper money can transfer live flu viruses for up to 17 days. And we rarely think about washing our hands before handling or after handling money. We just don't think about that, right? It doesn't cross our minds. Supposedly, uh, the research reveals that 80% of dollar bills have traces of cocaine. So much drug money going on in America today. Some of these bills stay in circulation for 10 to 15 years. So dollar bills... Don't go home and sniff your dollar bills tonight, all right? Here's a really crazy one. 94% of dollar bills have bacteria that cause staph infections. This is mainly because of people not washing their hands after using the restroom and then taking their money out and paying for something. Boy, all of you are going... Yeah, you're just like, oh, man, I didn't know we were going to deal with this tonight, right? (laughs) Bottom line, paper money is a magnet for bacteria and viruses. Cash is no longer king. Remember the oldest one? Cash is king. Well, cash is no longer king. The COVID-19 pandemic, or maybe we should call it, and I'm not going to get into this. I probably shouldn't even say this. Plandemic, maybe. We'll see has revealed the fear and concern that people have of contracting a deadly disease, right? The world went into fear mode just like that. You tell me. I mean, we're not making this stuff up. It's like one week the world was just trucking along just as usual and suddenly... Bam, not just the economy of the United States, the world economy was shut down. Countries were shutting down out of fear of what? A deadly disease called COVID-19. In China, where the whole thing got started, thus our president calls it the China virus, banks began disinfecting cash with ultraviolet or heat treatments. All the way back in February, they began to do that. So they would take their cash, all these paper bills, and they would begin to put them through those uh, ultraviolet lights or the heat treatments to try to kill any type of virus that might be on that paper money. The Bank of of, uh, Korea, uh, South Korea's central bank, is now keeping all the cash that it receives from local banks 
in a safe for two weeks because the coronavirus generally dies out during that time. So when they get cash, they don't turn around and give it right back out. They put it over in a safe and let it set until they're convinced the virus on it has now died. So what is now being promoted is what we could what? We could eliminate a lot of deadly viruses if we would become a what? Cashless society. That's what they're saying. It's no longer just a convenience issue. Now they're saying it's what? A health issue. It's a health issue. And what we're finding out is people will do anything to stay healthy. Right? We've seen that. We have turned the world upside down on its head <laughs> to try to stay healthy. None of us want the deadly disease. Now, the fifth advantage is quite possibly the main reason our government would push for a cashless society. The fifth advantage is really not an advantage for us, but it's an advantage for the government because it involves our favorite topic, taxes. Taxes. You say, what do you mean? Listen to the words of prophecy expert Dr. Mark Hitchcock. He lives and resides in Oklahoma. Uh, he has written a lot of books on the end time events. Listen to what he says. The U.S. government knows that millions of Americans operate outside the recognized economy. Many run family businesses or accept cash payments only and do not report their earnings to the IRS. Total reliance upon a money card or cashless system would allow the IRS to tax this underground economy, adding billions of dollars into the tax coffers. Listen to the words of Dr. Tim LaHaye and Dr. Jerry Jenkins from their book entitled, Are We Living in the End Times? I quote, Do governments want this technology to be compulsory? Absolutely. In America alone, millions of people are doing business under the table on a cash-only basis in order to bypass the enormous tax rate. Eliminating this possibility could net the United States Treasury an estimated $200 billion to a trillion additional dollars a year. Just think how fast the national debt... A lot of talk about the national debt today. Just think how fast the national debt could be paid with an increase of close to a trillion a year in currently unpaid taxes. Look soon for government to begin calling for legislation to do away with cash. End of quote. You say, Pastor Mike, all this info is interesting, but what does it have to do with biblical prophecy? We're in a church. This is supposed to be a Bible elective here tonight. Well, I wanted to set the stage a little bit, all right? I wanted to set the stage to help you understand what is transpiring today in this push toward a cashless society. And I would answer your question about what does this have to do with biblical prophecy by saying it has everything to do with biblical prophecy. Because the Bible predicted over 1,900 years ago that one man, one man, the coming Antichrist will ultimately take control of an entire world economy. As a matter of fact, the Bible connects the concept of a cashless society to the global economic control that the Antichrist will have during the tribulation period. I want us to read about it. Do you have your Bible open? You probably thought I would never come back to our text. All right. Revelation 13 and verse 16. By the way, Revelation 13, verse 1 through 10, the focus is on the beast that comes out of the sea, a reference to the Antichrist. Then you begin in verse 11 down to the end of the chapter, and you find what they call another beast coming up out of the earth, which would be the false prophet. 
And the two of them work hand in hand. This is not a lesson tonight to describe every characteristic of the Antichrist or every characteristic associated with the false prophet, okay? We could do whole studies on that. But the passage that I'm about to read is where the false prophet, the second beast, is assisting the first beast. That would be the Antichrist. Remember that Satan is all about counterfeits, right? If you've sat under any of my uh, prophecy teaching in the past, I've emphasized that he's all about the counterfeit. There is a true trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. There is a false trinity, a counterfeit trinity. That would be Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet. Okay, so two of them we read about here in chapter 13. But let's begin reading here in verse 16. And he, that is the false prophet, causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. And that no man might, what? Buy or sell. Isn't that what I've been talking a little bit about tonight? How you shop for groceries, how you pay for your uh, gasoline. You know, if you don't want to walk inside, you don't pay cash anymore. You just pay what? Your debit card or your credit card right there at the, uh, at the pump. So we're, this is very practical. And that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark or the name of the beast, he's talking about the first beast, the Antichrist, or the number of his name. Here is wisdom, let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred three score and six. We'll talk more about that in a minute, but that would be what? Six, six, and six. As one preacher has well said, if we are truly going to understand the times in which we live, we need to have a copy of God's Word in one hand and a newspaper in the other one. (laughs) Now, I know maybe we all don't get newspapers today, but the point he's trying to make is watch the news. Watch what is going on around the world. Have a copy of God's Word and you will see clearly that things are lining up for the end times. When it comes to a one-world global economy, the question is no longer if that actually can become a reality, but rather the question is when. When will this happen, <laughs> right? Maybe some of this stuff 50 years ago we would have said, I don't, I don't see how in the world. Boy, today you look at the landscape. And all that is transpiring and we say, oh yeah, this is doable. This is certainly doable. God knew it all along. (laughs) God's omniscient, right? He knows all things. And when he says something's going to happen, you can bank on it. It's going to happen. Now the current economic and technological trends and developments are setting the stage of the end times that are described in the Bible. Now, here in these verses that I've just read, it says that basically you will not be able to go to the grocery store during the tribulation period and purchase your groceries without, what, the mark of the beast. Maybe the signs will change. Right now, we see a lot of these signs, do we not? You go up to a store and it will say, no entry without a face mask. Maybe one day it will be no entry without the mark of the beast. Do you see how quickly our world has adapted to that? This suddenly is not as far-fetched as maybe what we thought. (laughs) You know, you may sit back and go, well, how in the world somebody buy it? Okay. And we find ourselves, maybe even if we don't totally buy into it or totally agree with it, in order to get what we need, what do we do? Put that face mask on and we go in and do what we got to do. And then as soon as we walk out the door, we take it off, right? (laughs) Maybe not too far in the future, the sign will read, no entry without the mark 
of the beast. That which used to be inconceivable is now becoming reality before our eyes. As I have already pointed out, the world has quickly adapted to the transition from cash to plastic cards. But in the future, even plastic cards will be labeled as archaic. Now for some of you, plastic cards was probably a leap into the future, you know. Well, I'm here to tell you, actually, plastic cards are slowly disappearing into the rearview mirror. And suddenly, we have at least two other sources of developmental technology. The first is mobile phones. Everybody seems to have a mobile phone, right? How many of you own a mobile phone or call a cell phone, right? Nearly everybody in here has one. How many of you have more than one mobile phone in your family? In other words, maybe your wife has one, your husband has one, your teenager has one, your, your dog has one, and all the rest. Okay, so all these mobile phones, okay? It's estimated that there are now 5.22 billion mobile phone users in the world. <laughs> That's incredible. What's amazing, and I know Lewis can verify this, you can go to a third world country, go out in the middle of the bush somewhere, you wonder how in the world God-forsaken area, people in mud huts and don't have, have clothes on and they're out there with a cell phone and you're like going. I've seen Maasai tribe out in Tanzania, just got no underwear on, just got the robe around them, they got their staff with them, Goats out there, and that Maasai tribe got a long, lanky. He's talking on his cell phone, you know. 5.22 billion. 66.83% of people in the world own a mobile phone. By the way, the ability to make a phone call is just one of the many I repeat, many functions of a modern-day mobile phone, right? The young ones here tonight understand what I'm saying. Mobile phones can now be used to send and receive emails. You can get on the Internet. Uh, you can instantly communicate to someone by using text. I text Brad Henderson over in Indusac, Tanzania, Nearly every week, I send a text, and he sends back a text. Sometimes he'll say, hey, can we FaceTime? I've got a question to ask you. And then suddenly on my cell phone, I see Brad. <laughs> and Brad and I are talking. Brad's on the other side of the world, Tanzania, Indusac. I've been there. There's nothing there. <laughs> and so suddenly you're able to communicate with FaceTime that way. And then you can watch TV. You can get on your cell phone and you can watch TV. You can find out if the Indians are winning. They are already playing and you can get on your cell phone, right? There goes Tim. He's digging for his cell phone right now. He's got the Indian shirt on over there. You can listen to the radio. You can even download your favorite movie. You can download your favorite songs, on and on and on the list goes. And plus you can pay for things with it. As a matter of fact, some of you may have the Bible downloaded on your cell phone or your mobile device, okay? So you have your Bible and you're able to do that. I usually do most of my morning Bible reading, the morning Bible reading that I do on my iPad. And so you say, why do you do that? that you don't sound old-fashioned. My eyes are getting bad, and I can't always see this. And the iPad, I mean, you can make that thing big, you know, and I can read it. I don't have any trouble with it, okay? Uh, no doubt some of you that are technologically challenged may be right now going, wow, I didn't know you could do all that with the, well, if it's a smartphone. We got lots of smartphones and lots of stupid people in the world today, right? <laughs> Those two are smartphones and dumb people. Okay. But folks, this is just the tip of the iceberg. My point is this. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to see the shift the shift that has taken place from cash 
to plastic cards to mobile phones. COVID-19 has only sped up that process. You can now order your groceries with your mobile phone, pay for your groceries with your mobile phone, let the grocery store know when you're planning on picking it up. My wife does this at Sam's Club. She says, now, hey, get on my, get on my cell phone and tell them that we're going to be parked in number four. You know, I, so you hit, well, you just open up the back. And they come and they load whatever you've bought at Sam's Club and shut the door for you and (laughs) gone. They do it at stores now, grocery stores, all the time. All what we call a contactless technology. But now let me take it to a fourth phase that is not too far in the future. Here's the four things that we've seen. Cash. Plastic cards, mobile phones, and then there's what we call biometrics. Maybe you don't always hear much about the biometrics because of all the other three that are being highlighted right now in our consumer-driven economy. Less cash than ever before, more plastic cards, but moving toward the mobile phone. But there's biometrics that is around the corner. Biometrics is the science of identifying people based on unique physical characteristics like a fingerprint or eye retina or eye iris. Voice recognition. Voice. Uh, if you have um, a phone like what I've got, uh, when you pull it up, All it has is a picture of Lauren's dog, Charlie, on there. My wife says she's been replaced on the front here. But anyway, like that, if I hold it up to my face, it has now, can be swiped and it's open. What is that? Face recognition is part of biometrics. That way, if you find my phone, you're going to have a hard time getting into it, right? Because it's not going to recognize your face. It's going to recognize my face. Right? There's an example, a simple example of it. So there's facial, there's voice. I get really aggravated with Siri. How many of you like Siri? I hate Siri. (laughs) Siri never understands what I'm saying. (laughs) And I think it, it, my wife says, I never have trouble with it. I said, I have trouble with it all the time. One of the worst things I can do is to speak a text and send it before I read it. You know what I'm saying? Have you ever done that where later you're like, oh, I can't believe I sent that? You know what I mean? So uh, one of the uh, members of our church, a lady, I will not mention her name. I was actually texting, checking on her son who had been in the hospital, and uh, I simply put, hello, uh, this is Pastor Frazier, and she typed back, and it said, hell. (laughs) She forgot the O on the end of it, and I thought, hmm, very interesting, you know, get that kind of a response from a member. But I personally don't, Siri does not recognize my voice, okay? For some reason, I get very, very frustrated with Siri. But voice recognition, face recognition, even a person's tongue, okay? There's all kinds of biometrics. The bottom line issue with biometrics is this. Am I who I say I am? My wife can take my credit card and she can go in to Giant Eagle and buy something with it. They never ask her. She sticks that in there, reads the chip, gets her groceries, walks out. Technically, anybody could take this card and use it. Okay, so now they're moving toward the, no, are you who you say you are? Okay, that's biometrics. Another biometric application is, here we go, syringe injectable microchip implant. With all of the information that I've just given you and more information, simply inserted into your body or underneath your skin. 
This implanted microchip could easily be upgraded to keep track of the financial transactions that you're doing, the movements where you're located, and the location of family members. They will promote it in a positive way like they have promoted everything else in a positive way. And most of the world will just buy right into it. As you are already aware, there is some talk about this happening with the vaccine. Study it, Google it, find out about it. (laughs) There's some big, big big-name people involved in it. But enough with all the technological developments and all of their ramifications. Let's go back to Revelation 13. But this time I want you to look at verse 15. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast. So the second beast, that would be the false prophet, had power. He had the ability to give life unto the image of the beast. That the image of the beast, that would be an idol. It almost reminds us of what we read about in the book of Daniel, right? With uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who refused to bow down before uh, the image. Okay, Very, very similar story here. That the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Now, my reason for backing up and reading Revelation 13 and verse 15 is this. The real issue in this passage of scripture is not economic, it's not financial, it's spiritual. Right? It's spiritual. Um, The mark of the beast is just a way to force people who are living during the tribulation to declare their allegiance to the Antichrist or not to get the mark of the beast and to declare their allegiance to Jesus Christ. There will be no neutral ground or indecision by any person during the tribulation period. According to verse 15, those who refuse the mark of the beast, they're going to be what? They're going to be killed. And by the way, this does become a sad reality because if you look at chapter 20, if you jump over to chapter 20, verse 4, you will see that it says, And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. The mark of the beast is a mark of loyalty to the Antichrist, and thus it is a spiritual decision. The financial, the economic ramifications are really secondary, but they reveal how this mark will give total control of a person's life into the hands of the Antichrist and his evil system. Sometimes we get intrigued, or should I say sidetracked, with a lot of speculation and maybe what I would even call sensationalism about the mark of the beast, right? 666. Or we get caught up in wondering who is the beast, right? Well, the Antichrist could be living today, but we got to figure out who it is. Don't waste your time, okay? 666. Six is, according to Revelation 13, the number of what? Man. It's the number of imperfection. The number of God is seven. The number of what? Perfection. Man was created on what? Day six, right? It's a lot of symbolism there. But don't get too caught up. Six, six, six. That would be for man, the number of man. It'd be like for God saying, holy, holy, holy. Three times the emphasis, okay? Don't get caught up in all the sensationalism of prophecy. (laughs) Stick with the basics. Understand the flow of things and where things are going. And understand the big picture. But don't try to come up with information about things that God doesn't give you information about. Right? I almost think it's not good to constantly be talking about prophecy. Now, that may sound a little bit strange to you, but I I think it can become such a consuming thing 
to where we don't think straight anymore about anything else. It's good to occasionally study prophecy and find out what's going on. But I don't think we need to talk about it 24-7, right? We've got to live the Christian life. (laughs) There's a job for us to do. So those who worship the beast, the Antichrist that we read about here, and receive his mark upon their forehead or in their right arm as a sign of their loyalty to him, there's those in the tribulation, And then there's those who worship Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, the 144,000, those who will refuse the mark of the beast, those who are willing to die for their faith in him. And those who receive the mark of the beast will eventually face the eternal wrath of God. In other words, they will deal with the consequences. They'll have to face the consequences of their decision. We read about that in Revelation 14 and verse 9. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, and by the way, commentators will talk about the mark. Uh, literally, uh, translation could be like a tattoo or uh, a branding. Back in ancient times, they would do that to slaves. Those who will receive the mark of the beast are really, in a sense, slaves to uh, the Antichrist and to his evil system. The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Those who refuse, though, the mark of the beast... They may lose their physical life in the tribulation, but they will ultimately gain eternal life. And I want to read again the verse that I read just a few minutes ago. I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. God honors their commitment to him. And yes, they lose their physical life, but they gain eternal life. Those who receive the mark of the beast during the tribulation period, they see it as being able to stay alive, physically stay alive, but they will face the eternal wrath of God. Are we living in the end times? I believe we are. Because the stage is being set for one man, the coming Antichrist, to take control of the world's economy. You might say, Pastor Mike, all this talk about end time events honestly frightens me. Well, first of all, let me say this. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, don't be frightened because... We're not looking for the coming of the Antichrist. Rather, like the apostle Paul told Titus, we are looking for that what? Blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. We are not looking for the Antichrist. We are looking for the true Christ who will come back for his church. By the way, And this is not where we give you a whole calendar of events. But the next event on God's prophetic calendar is the rapture. And that's a time when all true Christians who have died will be resurrected. And every true Christian who is still alive will be taken up into heaven without experiencing death. Boy, I sure hope I'm part of that crowd. Amen. As a believer in Jesus Christ, you have nothing to fear. The best is yet to come. For a lost person, for an unbeliever, this is as good as it gets. But for those of us who are believers, this is as bad as it gets. It could get worse, but we know that ultimately the best is yet to come for us, right? Because of our faith in Jesus Christ. Can I ask you a question? Would you be left behind if the rapture happened today? We believe in the imminent return of Jesus Christ, right? 
That means it could happen at any moment. There's nothing else, prophetically speaking, that has to happen before the soon coming of Jesus Christ. When he comes back for his church, his bride, dead in Christ will rise first, and then we which are uh, alive will be caught up together in the air. Then you have the seven-year tribulation period, and then you have the second coming of Jesus Christ, where he comes back with his feet touching the earth again. You have the battle of Armageddon. You have Satan bound and put into the uh, uh, being bound for a thousand years, is what I was trying to say, with the messianic kingdom and the millennial kingdom. But then he is turned loose at the end of the millennial kingdom, and he once again goes out and deceives the nations again. There's one last battle, and then you have the new heaven and the new earth. But what we are looking forward to is we are living in the church age, and we are looking toward the sky for the rapture, the rapture. Would you be left behind if the rapture happened today? If your answer is yes, or maybe, or probably, or I don't know, then listen to me very, very carefully. There is only one way to be prepared for the coming of Jesus Christ, and that is to receive him as your personal Savior. That's the only way to prepare. Listen to the words found in two passages of Scripture. Romans 5 verse 8 says, But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Aren't you grateful for that? Much more than being now justified by his blood. That's me. I've been justified by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. I am not justified by my own good works. I'm justified by his redemptive work on the cross. And it says that if you have been justified by the blood of Christ, then what? We shall be saved from wrath through him. Here's you another verse. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 9, For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain what? Salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. If you are an unbeliever tonight, can I encourage you to do three things? Number one, recognize that you are a sinner that cannot save yourself. You can't save yourself. Not one person is good enough to save himself. Number two, admit your need of Jesus Christ as your Savior. He is the only hope. Jesus is the answer. Without Christ, you will experience the damnation, the condemnation, the eternal wrath of God. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to experience that. Number three, believe. Believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried, and rose again. He is the living Savior. And if you're an unbeliever here tonight, I want you to know, if you'll call upon the name of Jesus, he'll save you. And then you don't have to worry about the future. You don't have to live in fear. You say, don't you fear the the coronavirus? I heard what one preacher said recently. I think it was Ted House when I was talking to him. He's down in Mount Oreb, Ohio. He told me, he said, you know what? The virus does not need to be feared, but it needs to be respected. I like that. It's a good way. We can't live our life in fear. Respect? Yes. I am continuing to do what my mama taught me to do. Wash your hands. Right? Do you remember that? You'd be outside playing and come in and say, now before you sit down and eat dinner, you wash your hands. Right? Get your finger out of your nose. Remember that? Do you remember? There's a lot of common sense there. You've been touching all this stuff and now what? You know what I'm getting at? Mouth. Get your hand out of your mouth. All that stuff that good parents taught their kids keep some distance from sick people. All that stuff is common sense. It's just common sense. So keep doing what mama taught you to do, right? And don't live in fear. The worst that could happen is I'm going to die and go to heaven. 
Now, you got to be smart. Don't be stupid. Use common sense. But if you do all that and something happens, I'm in the Lord's hands. Amen. All right, that's our first lesson. You going to come back next week? Or are you going to go... Come back again next week, all right? And don't forget the offering for the camp, all right? Don't forget your $5 bill. $5 foot long. All right, we'll see you.